I start recording. Okay, so yeah, I think that Mohammed really needs a little introduction. So uh, Mohammed is a postdoc uh, working at MAI, PhDs from Sapienza on Nonlinear Control, Digital Feedback. So uh, Mohammed will give us this lecture on feedback analyzation under digital control. Mohammed, stage Thanks. is yours. Thanks, Danny. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will be uh, an interesting talk for at least a few of you who work with feedback immunization. Uh, it's actually a continuation of a series that we intended to start. And this was supposed to be a long presentation of one and a half hours, but then I, I felt that it would be a little bit uh, exhausting for most people. And also it will be bugged down with a lot of details that are not necessary. So we changed it and we split it into two parts. Today we will just discuss the first part. And uh, yeah, and the idea is to talk about uh, feedback innovation, which is a very well known technique, but when you are designing digital feedback instead of the continuous type mode. Uh, in this sense, this talk will be, as usual, a little bit introductory, very basic. It will not be very formal, although we'll try to not lose uh, rigor in that sense. So we will try to be precise and correct, but uh, not very formal. Uh, we will first start with an example, with a motivating example in continuous time for feedback linearization. It's an academic example. And we will carry this example throughout this, uh, this talk. Then we will say we'll motivate our uh, our techniques that we will talk about later. So why we need digital redesign, let's say, of feedback linearizing uh, controls, because emulation fails and uh, there is reason for this, and we will discuss these reasons on the example. Then we will present the new techniques that you can use to mitigate some of the issues arising when you apply digital feedback linearization. Uh, this talk will not be very comprehensive, of course, <laughs> so we will not talk about uh, generalized holding schemes, uh, sampling schemes. It will not be very rigorous, it will not contain proofs, but uh, we will reference the needed literature later. Okay, so let's start. We start as usual with an example. So we have this system, it's a, uh, it's a system thanks to Leonardo, Leonardo Torres, which is a professor in Brazil, and uh, this is a benchmarking system. It, they try to make it as nonlinear as possible by including all these trigonometric functions, etc. But it's a simple system. It's, a, it's of dimension two, the state is based. So we have two states, one control, and the output is a function of the, of the first state. <coughs> and the problem is to find the control u such that this output follows a desired difference. And uh, there is no there is no specifications on the reference, so it can be a set point, it can be a time varying signal, whatever. So we want to find you such that we can do this. Okay. Let's look at our output. So this is the idea generated in, in continuous time. What we do is we look at the output and we see if the control directly directly influences the output and at what derivative. So can we does the function of the output contain u? No. So we, we differentiate the, the output one more time. So 2x1 dot minus sine x1 x1 dot for the cosine. And then we substitute x1 dot here. And we end, it, we end up with a function that is still not a function of u. So we cannot influence neither the output nor its velocity with the control. We go to the higher derivative. And we notice that uh, the higher derivative, actually, the second derivative, the acceleration of the output, contains x2 dot, but x2 dot depends on u. So through the control, we can directly influence the acceleration of, of the output, and, and uh, of course, we can carry that to the velocity and the, and the actual output itself. What does this mean? This means that the output is influenced at the second derivative, with the control. And this is basically the idea of the relative degree. 
the, the number of times you need to differentiate the output function to recover the input directly in the function of the output. Uh, let's call it R. So we have this uh, definition of the relative degree that is informal, but okay, it works for, for our purposes. So what? why did we do this? Okay. Generally, in continuous time, what we do when we have uh, a system that is very difficult to handle like this, is try to simplify it by using what is called coordinate change. Coordinate change are just functions that uh, transform your state into a different coordinate system. They have to meet specific uh, technical requirements. They have to be a homeomorphism. This is basically saying that they are continuous functions that are bijection with continuous inverse. Uh, preferably, they should be also with a, with a continuous derivative. Uh, but uh, so at a few moments, but these are not important. The idea is that we need to find new coordinates given what we know about the output and its derivatives such that we are able to, in fact, uh, uh, simplify the representation of this system. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I'm going to Thanks, Danny, for, for answering. Yeah. So, Okay, let's take the output itself and call it Z1. So Z1 is just the same expression at the output. So a function of X1 and X, X1 basically. And let's take the ferret derivative of the output and call it Z2. So this is a new, a new coordinate. And now let's differentiate Z1 and Z2. Uh, and what we end up with so before we differentiate, is, let's call this new variable z, which is a function of x, is our new coordinates. And we will differentiate it and write the representation of our system, of our dynamics in these new variables. But first, we need to verify that this function is actually a, a coordinate change, that it meets these uh, technical requirements, that it has a continuous inverse, it's a bijection. Uh, you can use uh, any any existence result by just, for example, looking at the Jacobian and seeing that it's non-singular uh, almost everywhere in the status space, and you know that, okay, this function, which is the output and its ferris derivative, actually are a coordinate change, are a valid coordinate change. It's always the case, by the way, that when the relative degree is defined, that the resulting ferris R minus one derivative of the output are a valid choice for the coordinate chain. OK, so we have our new coordinate. Let's write the derivative of this new coordinate. If we write that one dot, which is actually y dot, which is actually the second uh, component of our of our new coordinate. So it's z2. And if we write that two dot, we end up with this very simple expression in terms of the z coordinate. And now our system in this new coordinates takes this very simple form that is very nice and easy to handle. No? And instead, by looking at the control, and actually, of course, by our choice, the output is, is, is itself Z1. So now we can find U such that Z1, which is the, our output, follows a desired reference. Here comes the feedback linearizing uh, control, which is just to cancel these terms by just setting u to be the negative of these terms plus a fictitious, we call it external linear control. If we substitute this here, then what we get is a double integrator, right? Because we just canceled all of this and we are replacing everything here with v. And so this is the intuition by, of saying, well, input output feedback linearizing is that after the coordinate change, you have your system, you have your states, you do a coordinate change and you get the, the new coordinate, which is Z, and you feed it back to this a new input output linearizing feedback. The link between the input and the output of the system becomes linear, typically a chain of integrators, in this case, a double integrator. And so this is the idea of the name. Okay. Uh, I can share directly here uh, the MATLAB for this part and to to understand a little bit better for those who are not familiar. So, okay, 
So this is the dynamics. This is the dynamics that uh, of our example just we, we saw recently. And let's assume that this is an actual physical system. So this will be outside of our computer or uh, microcontroller or BLC or wh wherever we are implementing our control. Inside the control, this is what we are implementing the, the, the code that we are implementing. It's just a coordinate change and a linearizing feedback. And then, of course, after doing this, the system that we are looking at from here, from V to Y, is a linear system, which is, uh, which is a system that of double integrators. For that, we can design V using, for example, ball placement techniques or any, any, any linear technique that you are interested in to derive the output to go to any to any place that you want. And uh, if we if we try to to run this, for example, for this case, let me let me de disable the first one. Okay. We can actually drive the output to follow this reference. The output in our case would be this red line, and it's asymptotically going to the reference by just using ball placement in our case, right? So we are just placing the balls of the double integrator in uh, in negative in the negative uh, half plane, in the negative part of the of the complex plane. Okay. So. Okay, we can design now V to make Y follow whatever reference that we want. And we are successful. Now, what about uh, this that is problematic, let's say. Okay. Let's look at our system again. And now assume in our MATLAB that in our, uh, in our, in our implementation that uh, Indeed, we have for the state a, sen a sensor that has a specific uh, sampling rate, and the control is fed through an actuator that has a specific holding rate, right? So this is in the physical world, and this is in, a co in our computer, and these two blocks represent the sampling and holding of our uh, of our signals. Uh, so that means if we if we actually just not modify anything about the code and uh, we control the system using our feedback linearization, linearization technique in continuous time, we can get decent results as long as these sampling and holding devices are very fast. Not only that, as long as also some other technical aspects pertaining to the nature of our dynamics hold true, and we will come to this later. Okay. So. Uh, in our example again, if we if we run for example, if we run, if we if we look at the at the second uh, at the second part which I call emulation, it's just holding the continuous time feedback constant over the sampling period, and uh, we notice the results. If I if I am sampling at a if these two devices, the, the actuator and the sensor, are working at a rate of delta sampling rate of 0.2 seconds, this is the result. We are not able to replicate the results in continuous time. But if we decrease, of course, maybe we can get better results. So we can see that we get better and better. Not it's still not as good as the continuous time, actually, because we have higher peaks here. We have higher amplitudes of the control if we zoom in, and uh, the control is not as smooth. So, yeah, we can get uh, good results by having faster sensors and actuators, but also having a dynamics that's simple enough, such that the nonlinearity is not uh, influencing in influencing the control. I will see this. So, okay, then there is a problem. The source of this problem is can be found by just looking at the at the actual as the actual solution of the system. So this is our continuous time system. We integrate it. If we integrate these functions, we end up with the with an expression for the evolution of the z 
states at each instant of time having this expression. This is obtained by just using Tyler expansions to approximate the integral, uh, taking, con taking higher and higher order of the derivatives. So we take uh, the first, for the first state, we want uh, z1 of k plus one, we, it's z1 of k plus the integral of this, which is approximated by having a whole series of delta z2 dot plus delta square over two z2 double dot plus delta cube over three factorial z1, z1, uh, one, sorry, z1, uh, three dots, etc. And if you replace this expression with the expression of the derivative of z1, it's z2, the double de derivative, you, you differentiate twice, you get this terms and so on. And for the other terms, we don't, we denote them by O of delta cube to denote that they depend on at least a power of delta to the power square, to the power uh, cube, sorry. Similarly for Z2, we do the same and we derive this function. So this is, uh, this is actually the, the evolution in time of our states when we do the integration. What does this uh, formula tell us? Okay. If we, if we put directly the control that we designed in continuous time here in, in place of u, so we put uh, the evaluation of this at the time in instant k and we hold it constant, we notice that the result is this system. It's, not, it's no longer the double integrator. It's, it's similar to the, it's, it's linear, it's similar to the double integrator, but it has these system matrices which are a bit different compared to the double integrator, right? And then the rest of the dynamics is contained in this reminder term, which we denote O of big delta square, because the least uh, power is delta square here. Okay, so this can tell us that, well, maybe we need to redesign V of K instead of using ball placement to put the ball in this negative real, with negative real bars as in continuous time, by redesigning them just by stabilizing a system that is described by these matrices, even using ball placement, right? So is that enough? It could be enough. And we can see also here. Okay. So for small delta, we notice that the, emul the emulation, this is the continuous time solution, and this is without change, but considering the holding and, uh, and, uh, and and sampling devices. And this is by redesigning V of K to take into consideration the new system matrices. Okay, if we increase now delta again, 2.2 where the emulation fails, what we can see is that, of course, the continuous time is never changing our redesign still is able to maintain the, the desired behavior, but the emulation, as we see, as we saw before, failed, right? So it was just enough in this case to redesign V of K, the external uh, control, let me go back here, to, to redesign this V of K to stabilize a system of this form instead of a system described by A equals 0, 1, 0, 0, B equals 0, 1, C equals 1, 0. But it's still not enough because we can do always better. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, now, this is the, 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 the system that we have. We say that it's not guaranteed that it's, in, it's enough to just redesign V because in this case, yes, delta small enough will help us. But if the nonlinearities are peculiar, then we can, we might need to do something more. Okay, so let's look back again at our system described in the discrete time domain in this form. And the source of the problem relies in the fact that in the continuous time, we saw that we needed to differentiate the output twice to see the influence of the, out, of the input. Here, if we look at the output, just one step ahead in the future, we notice the influence of the of the input. So can we 
in some sense mimic the, the relative degree in continuous time by getting rid of this influence and making it appear later, so at y of k plus 2. So you need to look two steps ahead in the future to see the input. So that we are we are having something similar to the relative degree in continuous time, but in the digital domain. Well, the answer is yes. Whenever you have a problem, always look for a coordinate change. This is the this is the takeaway, I think. Let's say. So okay, let's write this new output function, which is a mix of the first step and the delta dependent function of the second step. So z1 of k minus delta over 2 z2 of k. Okay, if we write the one step ahead prediction of this output function, which is z1 of k plus 1 minus delta over 2 z2 of k plus 1, and substitute and compute, then we, we notice that we actually get rid of the terms that depend on the control in this function, at least up to powers of delta square. So that means that we are able to go to y of k plus 2 in order to see, we have to go to y of k plus 2 in order to see to see the influence of the input. OK. OK, similar to what we did in continuous time, let's now redefine a coordinate change using this output function. So this output function, which is this, a new coordinate, we differentiate it from, from the previous coordinate z by just adding the delta here to, uh, to emphasize that this new coordinate change depends on delta. And we leave the second the second state as it is. And writing the evolution of this of this system in these new coordinates, we notice that this system takes this form, in which actually the you need to looking at the output, you need to go two steps ahead in the future to to see the influence of the output. Okay, this is very nice, and it just needs a linear coordinate change, as we can see. Does it perform better than our redesign? Or let's see. So for our uh, for our for our example, <laughs> again. So this is this is our same system, same sampling and holding device, same continuous time coordinate change and linearizing feedback, but this new additional coordinate change and this redesigned uh, linear control, as we said. And let's see the performance of this compared to the other two. So, we go here, we need to plot it as well. Okay. And at point two, we saw that the holding the continuous time solution fails. The redesign performs a little bit better, but uh, yeah. This is the situation that we risk. This is our new change. Notice that uh, the peak of the control is slightly similar to the peak of the redesign. The emulation obviously fails. OK, so now if we increase this a little bit more, let's go even higher and see the result. The continuous time we don't uh, get. Holding the continuous time all, always fails, of course. The redesign is getting a little bit worse and worse in terms of tracking, in terms of the control. But this new approach with just adding a coordinate change, still managing to get better control, better tracking error. Okay, and we can go higher as well. So if we want to break everything, Again, first time the emulation, the redesign with the emulation now is failing. But this approach by just adding a coordinate change still manages to give more or less satisfactory results. Okay, so this is nice. Uh, let's go back. Okay. So what we learned in this is that it's not just enough to redesign the external linear control B based on the new system matrices, but rather also add a new coordinate change. When we add a new coordinate change, which we call it V delta, then the system will be described by system matrices of this form, which are 
much closer to the double integrator, of course. Our new output, however, which is y delta, which is the fairy state of this, will be describing the original coordinates of the continuous time with this matrix. Right? Okay. So, uh, can we do even better? Okay, this is the, the view of this, is that to try to always uh, do a little bit better. So, notice that still we are not considering nonlinearities in terms of powers of delta cube and delta square on the on the dynamics, right? Because this uh, of big delta square is actually of this uh, form. So we can try of thinking about uh, about changing this and trying to get even better results. So let's expand more. Let's write our dynamics in the new coordinates, but up to terms in of delta quattro four and of delta q and this will be the result okay now we want to make sure that all the controls here all this part will be a linear a linear input output link as in feedback linearization okay and of course the idea is that typically the, the more higher power you go because delta is less than one the, the better it approximations you get and the better tracking behavior you get and the more significant nonlinearities you you can fill out. Okay, so looking at our 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 system up to the second order, and write our control u as two terms u zero plus delta u one. This is just a trick. Okay, if we substitute this everywhere here, what we get is that uh, u zero plus delta u one. But we are focusing on on terms that have delta to the power four, to the power three maximum, and to the power four we neglect. So that means that this term here will disappear because delta cube multiplying delta will be delta to the power four, so we'll go with the reminder term here. So we cancel this term. Similarly, we cancel this part here, and we are left with delta u1 in this part. Okay. Now you can see what I'm trying to do, because u0 can be the same as the continuous time input output feedback linearizing control. That means it takes this form and we get this system with, with one corrective control term that we can use to cancel out all of these other terms in the dynamics and to get to get a, a nice linear linear uh, dynamics that is equivalent to our original system. OK, to do this, an additional coordinate change. Of course, always just add coordinate change one on top of the other to get rid of <laughs> successive nonlinear terms. In our case, in our case, this uh, coordinate change will take this form. We will we'll learn in a few minutes that all of these coordinate changes that seems a bit uh, strange and out of nowhere, there is a systematic way and explicit uh, expression to compute all of them, and so it's not, uh, yeah, it's not an issue. Okay, so if I apply this new coordinate change and write the dynamics in terms of eta, the new coordinate uh, variable, we we write uh, that dynamic will take this form, and we can see that the fairest uh, part of the dynamics is already linear up to four, and this u1 can be used to just be the negative of these terms that are underlined, right? So you can just write u1 to cancel these terms. And what you end up with is a, non is a linear dynamic described by the same, uh, uh, the same uh, system matrices that we saw earlier, but in a higher order of approximation. What is the catch to this? Notice that one of the terms that you need to cancel depends on a prediction of the external linear control. So this is the only catch in this part. OK. So now we, we we can do this also for O delta 4, O delta i, i larger than or equal to 5 to whatever term by just repeatedly adding successive coordinate changes and corrective feedback terms. OK. So summarizing what we did in this example so far is that at the beginning, we have a system that is feedback linearizable in continuous time. 
we keep the feedback linearization in continuous time, but we define an additional coordinate change that takes the new states in continuous time to a new delta dependent state. And then we redesign the external linear control based on the new description of the discrete time system matrices. This will give us much better results than just holding the continuous time control constants. If we even want to go better, we can just add an additional coordinate change, an additional corrective feedback term to cancel the nonlinearity in a similar fashion to feedback linearization. OK, now can we make this process a little bit more systematic? And uh, can we even do better? I think this we will leave to bar two. Also, probably this because of time, but we will see. OK, so for let's try to get more systematic. By the way, so far, I hope everything in the example is clear uh, before uh, going to the more formal statement. Yeah, I, I don't know if there is any question. At this point, uh, free to interrupt at any time, and uh, people yeah. are ready. Like, uh, <laughs> okay, stoned by mathematics. Anyway, yeah. So, okay, this is our uh, block diagram of the system, and uh, we notice that this is a dynamics. We wanted to feedback linearize in continuous time in our computer in the controller side, so we added a linearizing feedback and a coordinate change and the dynamics looking at it from V to the output will look like a linear dynamic with a double integrator dynamic here, right? right? Then we said, OK, if we want to do better than just keeping the, the same design by holding the continuous time feedback, constant, we need to add a new coordinate change here and redesign the V control here. So what about this coordinate change that we computed for the, for the example that can be made systematic? Can we actually have a formula to compute this irrespective of the system? OK, fortunately, yes. And even more fortunate is that this coordinate change is a linear coordinate change. OK. That means that this coordinate change is just a matrix multiplying our state. This matrix, TR of delta, is described by this form. The, notice that this TR of delta depends only on delta and R, R which is the relative degree of the continuous time system. So a priori, if you know the relative degree of your system, you can directly compute this matrix, and then that means you directly computed this coordinate change which is very cool in fact. So, and uh, these matrices here that are inside the T matrix, just take this form. Uh, they look uh, the same as you see in, in digital, in typical digital discrete time uh, approximations of continuous time system. So they are not very special. They just depend on delta and depend on the relative degree. They don't depend on anything else. So. All these matrices you can build in your in your control algorithm a priori just by knowing the relative degree. Okay, let's look at our example earlier. Our example had the relative degree R equals two. So the matrices A R C R and B R take this form: one delta zero one delta square over two delta C R from the formula by evaluating delta square zero one the last row basically of the something similar to the controllability matrix here if you notice actually there is an inverse here just to correction then you get this c2 matrix okay let's fill our coordinate change in. our coordinate change the fairest row of our coordinate change is this matrix so one minus delta over two and the second column is the second row is this which in our case when we evaluate it is zero one now, if we look at this and compare it to what we found earlier in the example, all right, and go back. Notice that exactly one minus delta over two, zero one multiplying z is, is the matrix that we obtained now. Yeah. So for a system of, of relative degree two, this is always the matrix T that you multiply your, your system. So 
for any system that has a relative degree two, you just insert this T matrix here. Similarly, for a system with a relative degree three, you can just fill it and, and so on and so on. So given the relative degree, you can compute the coordinate change a priori. Very nice. What about the linear control? The linear external control. How how to redesign this linear external control? Okay. It's also a priori you can redesign it just knowing the relative degree. Because if you know the relative degree, then what you need is a control V such that it controls or stabilizes the system that is described by these matrices. And these matrices only depend on the relative degree. And so both blocks in our newly designed controller in the digital domain just depend on the relative degree. You, you can compute them a priori. You don't need to change a lot in your code. You can just uh, insert them. Yeah. Okay. Can we do the same also for successive? Because we notice that we can also approximate up to higher orders. Can we also make systematic uh, ways of computing the successive coordinate changes in the higher orders and the corrective feedback terms? For example, when we go one one step higher, okay, we have this few steps in the in our algorithm. So we first apply, we first compute the T matrix, and then we apply this coordinate change. Then we compute the discrete time equivalent model up to then the desired order of approximation. Then we set our feedback to be the continuous time linearizing feedback plus an additional corrective term. Then we define this coordinate change, which depends on the newly defined coordinates and some functions gamma, gamma i. These functions have also a very explicit form. So they take gamma i would be the i throw of this expression here, which mainly depends on your dynamics. So the vector fields of your dynamics and a constant matrix that depends on delta. And then from these functions, you can compute the corrective term and you end up with the linear equivalent uh, dynamics in the input output link. And so you have a procedure, you have also an algorithm, explicit formula to compute the corrective terms, the coordinate chains up to any desired order of approximation. So, okay. So I will summarize. I think we will uh, will not. Uh, yeah, we'll leave for questions, and instead we will move the motion uh, motion planning application to the next session. So uh, I will summarize now. Okay. So what we saw, the idea of partial feedback linearization in continuous time is to just render the link between the input and the output of a dynamical system to be linear. We do this by applying uh, a change of coordinates and a feedback in continuous time. Then when we implement this in our uh, in our applications, for example, by to control the robot, we typically just hold the feedback constant over the sampling period. We notice that this may not be always good, not only due to the increase of the uh, or the or if the sampling period is not constant, but also due to the higher, higher uh, nonlinearities in the description of your system in the discrete time domain. Okay, to mitigate this, a Ferris approach was just to redesign only the external linear feedback to compensate for this change in the system description in the discrete time domain. Additionally, we can do better by adding a coordinate change that only depends on the relative degree and we can compute it offline and we can just plug it in, in, the, in our controller. Up to now, everything is an approximate uh, solution. Can we get exact solutions of the same problem? So instead of looking at the system in continuous time, that is feedback linearizable and try to apply coordinate change to just keep the feedback linearizability. Can we can we directly solve the feedback uh, linearization problem in, in the discrete domain? What are the side benefits of this? And this is a hint actually for the second part, hopefully later, that sometimes 
in continuous time, you need, for example, uh, a relative degree extension to be able to apply feedback linearization. But through exact techniques in the digital domain, you can actually get rid of this relative of dynamic extension. You don't need a relative degree extension. You can directly solve using what is called matching equalities. And we'll use this to, to plan motions of a robotic uh, arm. So, okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for for your attendance and questions. Any questions? Any any points of interest? Yes, I think there is a, a sun. Okay. No, no, it was a mistake. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. No, uh, Mohammed, thank you very much for uh, for this presentation. So the um, yeah, the fact that actually uh, we can ah, there is Guillermo. Sorry, Guillermo, go. Otherwise, the bias. Yeah. Yes, yes. It was it was just a clarification when you presented the coordinate change matrix TR of delta, and you uh, found the 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 way that it looks like in our example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe okay. next. So this is TR of delta for a system that has a relative degree two, right? We compute it. By yeah, this, you. Uh, maybe it was yeah. the previous slide. This oh one. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to have a look at why uh, in the last row you have zero one. Uh, because it. it okay. If you if you substitute C two delta here, one minus yeah. delta two. And if you substitute this matrix here minus the identity of order two and multiply, you will get this. Yeah, okay. Okay, there's uh, another matrix inside. Okay, cool. Because it looked like uh, a vector, a column vector. Okay. Thank you. No worries. And in fact, if we go to the example here, yeah. This is precisely the coordinate change that we computed in the example. Okay, thank you. Okay, Diego. Yes. At first, thanks, Mohamed, for uh, for your talk. It was pretty clear to me, and it brings me it brings me back to the university time. It is always a nice feeling. Um, I have a question on. Uh, I don't remember which is the slide. Uh, at one point, you. Uh, you said that the for uh, one uh, transformation, probably the second or the third one, we need uh, a, uh, a an estimation of the next output, right? Uh, it, it was B uh, at okay. the K plus one. Is this something that could be problematic, uh, uh, or in practice, or this is something? Uh, how how would you do it uh, in a, in a practical sense? So the easiest way of doing this is to, so let me go back one step before for people who to, to understand what Diego was asking. So we said that if we want to approximate up to one order higher, we need to compute a coordinate change, but also a feedback corrective term, which is this term in red here, to cancel these new appearing nonlinearities. But part of these appearing nonlinearities, if you notice, depend on on the control at the next step. But since they depend on V of K plus one and V of K is the external linear control of the next step, and later we we discuss that the 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 external control can always be computed a priori by knowing the relative degree, then you can always compute this V of K plus one because it's just a control of a, a system that is in this form and its prediction. So yeah. Okay, okay. It makes sense. Thank you. I don't know if Guillermo wants to ask another question of it uh, Rosie's hand by chance. No, Danny. Okay, 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 okay. There is uh, Ozan. Ozan? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. 
Okay, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about, um, so before you, you dem in your demonstration, you were changing Delta manually and you're checking the response. And whenever, when it's not satisfactory, you, you understood that you probably needed to improve your design. So my question is, is there like a, a systematic way to, to say, okay, if I go without the the uh, the transformation coordinate transformation, I can have up to this sampling period. Like, can you? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's very it's very nice. It's a very nice question, in fact. So uh, okay, uh, let me go here first to the slide to discuss this. So. In this slide, we said that after applying our continuous time uh, feedback linearization technique, we are left with these reminder terms, right? And these reminder terms are terms depending on the dynamics, and they are being multiplied by delta in these powers. Now, there is a technical statement you can make to see the norm of this reminder term and its relation to the tracking error and there is a link and if this norm is higher than a specific function of the track then you can say well delta just redesigning v is not enough and i need this coordinate change to plug in but yeah so but there is a systematic way that depends on the norm of the reminder uh, yeah we can go on this if you want no no that's cool that's enough <laughs> thanks the 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 thing to to notice is that and I, I and i would love if someone who is using now feedback linearization for example the ion cup team i think they are using it in in some in some of their controllers if you are using feedback linearization try to try to do this like just plug in this coordinate change here this t matrix and rewrite your linear control and see the results in terms of tracking error that would be a very nice uh, study on that on, on, an, on an actual robot, but OK, that would. And uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this T matrix is you can compute. And always because we are working on robotics, always we are dealing with systems that have a relative degree two, no? We are working on accelerations. If we are working on jerk, it's a relative degree three. So you can already take these expressions for T2 or T3, and you just plug it and see, and see what happens. Uh, that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, I know that Giuseppe was working on it and also Afaf, but I also know that the the sampling period for us is a mess because at least the commands which we send to the turbines are not exactly, no, not the commands, but the measurements that we get are not exactly what we think the, uh, the period is so. We can give an approximation of the sampling period, but it's not accurate. So this can this can be helpful in this case to give you an additional layer of protection against changes in the holding and sampling. Okay. Nice. Okay, Italian, I think. Yes, uh, I, I would like to ask something. C can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to ask you something about the um, gamma function that you used to change the coordinates at the end. And so, you, as if I um, understood well, you said that you can go higher than the relative degree in the uh, derivative uh, extension in this case. Um, but um, in the uh, gamma function, if you can, um, okay. So it, it, you can go higher uh, until you have a possibility to differentiate the dynamics, of course. Is it, is it yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and it is not uh, the same thing as performing a dynamic extension of the pivot linearization. No, because now you are just, uh, you are not redefining a new state variable. That is this uh, derivative, right? You are just computing a de uh, these derivatives to redefine to redefine a state not to introduce a new state 
dy dynamic extension always implies also you are augmenting the dimension of your state space, right? So you have yeah. a system and then you add new additional states that are just integrators. In our case, we are differentiating to get to just reach the, the nonlinearities that are appear in the discrete time uh, description of our system. And then we take this description and plug it to redefine the already existing states. So we are not augmenting the state space dimension. Yeah, OK, that's very cool, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. No worries. Any other question? No, I just wanted to conclude that discretizations, uh, I mean, the process of discretizing the system can lead to disaster. OK, so we know that we can get to instabilities. OK, and usually this is this can be seen like X dot equals to U. OK, so if you start with that and you discretize it, you, did, you do like XK plus one minus XK equals delta T times U. And then if U is equal to minus K delta X of K, then you have this matrix, which somehow if it's greater, that number is greater than one, you, are, you, are, you start being in trouble. So uh, and sometimes I feel that as a research team, we pay real, really little attention, OK, to, to this criticization effects, OK? And um, probably that might be a black hole, OK? Uh, that uh, might have an effect that we do not understand as long as we don't test things out. OK, so clearly, uh, on the one hand, uh, and, and I mean, uh, and we have to say that at least so far, our control architect is not that far, OK? That, that fast, sorry, not that far, that fast. OK, so we are talking about uh, even hundreds of hertz, OK? So 100 hertz for uh, feedback linearization control loop. So, yeah, I let's say I would uh, somehow encourage uh, uh, the feedback linearization uh, um, people that are here that are using feedback linearization and then Mohammed also in MPC because then this stuff is used in MPC, so you should understand what is going on when you propagate this forward and you know better than me this stuff. So, uh, anyways, let's say if we start from instantaneous control, then it would be nice to let's say at least start doing uh, at least testing once, twice, give it a try, guys. Okay, so yeah, and we have the material here. We have Mohammed seated there, so you can go there and ask him if there are doubts. So take advantage of these opportunities. OK, cool. Great. At this point, we are in time. Mohammed, thank you very much. I will, uh, say, I will be sending everyone the YouTube link once ready and uploaded. So OK. Thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. And give me feedback. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Thanks, Mohan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.